Around this time of year, a lot of countries remember those who served in wars. In the UK, many people wear red poppies. In the US and Canada, they have Veterans Day. But why do we remember these wars? Is it to ensure that they never happen again? Or, in a strange way, is it to ensure that they do happen again? In order to answer this question, we're going to have to look at nationalism. Political scientist Benedict Anderson said that there's no stronger symbol of nationalism than the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. A lot of countries have these, and the whole point is that we know nothing about the person inside the tomb except that they share our nationality. Many of them are in fact empty. The tombs are full, Anderson says, of national imaginings. And from this, he draws a link between nationalism and war, killing, death. The cultural significance of such monuments becomes even clearer if one tries to imagine, say, a tomb of the unknown Marxist, or a cenotaph for fallen liberals. Is a sense of absurdity avoidable? The reason is that neither Marxism nor liberalism are much concerned with death and immortality. Anderson thought it's very weird that nationalism has inspired so much death. So many people dying and willing to die and kill for their country. But if you say, I'm going to die for my country, what is it that you're willing to die for there? Is it your home? Well, your home is just a tiny part of the nation. Is it your fellow countrymen? Well, what links you to them? Most of the people in your country you will never meet. And what makes them different from foreigners in terms of your willingness to die for them? Is it freedom? Independence? Democracy? Well, lots of countries have those, so why are you willing to die for this particular country's freedom, independence, democracy? What is it that links you to your nation and its people? Well, Norwegian sociologist Johan Galtung says that nationalism is constructed out of a shared belief in trauma and glory. Here, again, we see the link between nationalism and death. When a nation believes that they share glory points, that's them believing that past uses of violence were legitimate and good. When a nation believes they share trauma points, that's them believing that future violence against those who inflicted the trauma would be legitimate. So maybe what links you to your nation is a shared sense of military history. After a war, Galtung says that nations can have a lingering DMA complex, a system of beliefs and values about the war that make future wars more likely. The D stands for dichotomy. When the nation remembers the war, they imagine that they and their enemies were totally different and there were no similarities. The M stands for Manichian. They believe that the enemy was 100% evil and they were 100% good. And the A stands for Armageddon. The war was significant, important, eternally important. The upshot of this DMA complex, this system of beliefs about the war, is that if there is any hint that the war might not really be over, people jump to legitimise further violence. Let's use an example. I know my brain could use one. As we know, the UK fought against the Nazis in World War II. Last year, our parliament debated whether or not to commit airstrikes in Syria, and one of our politicians, a man named Hilary Benn, explicitly compared the so-called Islamic State to the Nazis in order to justify killing them. He was criticised at the time, even by people who agreed with his conclusions, for oversimplifying both World War II and the present war, for using the British DMA complex, a particular interpretation of our military history, to justify a militarised future. That way of remembering World War II didn't make future wars less likely. It actually caused one. You might think that Remembrance Services and Veterans Day aren't about justifying past or future violence, they're just about remembering it. 
But last year, another of our politicians, Jeremy Corbyn, was heavily criticised for wearing one of these. A white poppy. The white poppy serves the same function of remembrance, but it also says that the wearer believes that war is not a good method of solving conflict. And the question I invite you to ask yourself is, why would wearing a white poppy be a controversial statement if the red one isn't about justifying violence? It has been argued by a lot of people that the way we currently remember wars and honour veterans reinforces the DMA complex, which makes future wars more likely. I want to draw on a point by the historian Edward Said here and say that criticising cultural symbols is not to devalue them. To talk about Britain's firebombing of Dresden, or Churchill's contribution to the Bengal famine, is not to say that they are 100% evil and should never be talked about. It's never that simple. Rather, it's to appreciate their true value, to look at them honestly and in detail, and say that they were products of their time, and therefore they present an opportunity to transcend their limitations and do better in our time. That's something we can't do if we romanticise our history, especially the nasty parts. But I wonder, what happens when different groups within the same nation have different trauma and glory points? African Americans and First Nation Americans have very different trauma and glory scores from, say, white Americans, because the USA was built on the slavery and genocide of the first two groups by the third. And so you get different kinds of nationalism emerging. The black nationalism of people like Marcus Garvey and Kwame Ture was centred around dismantling oppressive political and economic structures, whereas white American nationalism is built around excluding those who are seen as unruly because of their race. The nationalism of First Nation Canadian peoples is different again. It's often grounded in appeals to legal decisions that were made a long time ago. The Mohawk people of Aquasasne, for instance, defend to this day their right to travel across their territory, which the US-Canadian border cuts right through the middle of, based on the Wampum Treaty of 1664. If you read some First Nation Canadian nationalist writing, they are experts in Canadian legal and case history. They have to be. In their excellent video on the difference between history and the past, PBS Idea Channel say that history is an essentially interpretive process, and so different nationalisms will provoke different interpretations. A white Brit might look at Churchill's historical role very differently from, say, a British person of Indian descent. A white American might look at Columbus very differently from a First Nation American. Both nationalisms, both arguably patriotism, but very different nonetheless. Remembrance services show us a country's official nationalism, if you like, the official version of military history, which often reflects the beliefs of the dominant group in that nation. To the extent that the history in Remembrance Services is romanticised, it might be what philosophers have variously called a simulacrum, the hyperreal, or a copy without an original. Not so much a reflection of the past as a reflection of us in the present. This Remembrance Sunday, I invite you to remember that history is constructed. You have to choose which events to focus on and fit them into a story that emphasises the ones you think are important. And so the telling and remembering of history will reflect the perspectives and political beliefs of the storyteller. Patreon.com slash PhilosophyTube allows me to keep paying the rent. If you have one or two dollars a month, that can really help me give someone free education. And don't forget to subscribe.